Victoria arranges a wedding for a couple. Everything is well organized, down to the minor details, from how the tables stand to when the drinks will come into play when the wedding starts and even which flowers are used for the occasion. Everything goes as Victoria imagined it would. Newlyweds express their gratitude towards her for her hard work. Victoria has to leave the wedding because she is going to organize her best friend's wedding. As soon as she starts walking toward the exit, she catches the bouquet toss, looks at it for a couple of seconds, smiles ironically, and gives it to some random woman standing beside her. Victoria arrives at her friend's place. Tracy greets her and asks why she needs three pairs of heels for a wedding. Victoria, as always prepared, answers that it's her wedding, two because she will be happy to have them, and a third because she is indecisive. Tracy agrees. She rumbles about the wedding and the amount of decision-making it requires from her. If she knew it would require so much of her time spent on organizing, she would have run away. Victoria immediately answers that life is an endless decision-making tree, and not only her wedding, once again underscoring her rational and pragmatic way of thinking. They sit down and drink some wine while discussing the details of the wedding. As it turns out, Victoria's ex-boyfriend will be attending the wedding for the entire week as well, and they chose him as the best man. Victoria urges Tracy that she shouldn't be worried about her at all, because she is feeling rather excited for that to happen rather than worried about it. Six months have passed since they broke up, and Victoria thinks this time is enough for them to think about their past mistakes and finally reconnect. Suddenly, Tracy hits her with a harsh reality. Victoria's ex is bringing his new date to the wedding. Victoria tries to mask her feelings with a smile for her friend, and she encourages her best friend that she doesn't have to worry about it at all, topping it up with the facade of a smile. Tracy, Mike, and Victoria arrive in Paris and immediately head for the hotel, where they are going to stay and celebrate their wedding. Tracy and Mike feel tired from the jet lag, but Victoria is as energetic as ever. One of the employees meets them, and he immediately sends them to their room for rest. Victoria stays. She sees the welcome baskets for guests, and even though she seems to like them, she is a perfectionist and pays attention to everything and anything. So she corrects these details and gives instructions about how they should be. But the employee tells her that she should find some time to enjoy herself and see the sightseeing in Paris. She refuses politely, leading the newlyweds to the place where they will get married. She explains everything to the core. Victoria feels great responsibility because it's her best friend's wedding, so she puts twice as much effort into all of this as she would usually do. The party meets up with two of their friends, Seth and Natalie, and Victoria introduces them to Henry, the hotel's employee when suddenly time freezes for Victoria as she sees her ex-boyfriend coming towards them with his new girlfriend. Victoria is in disarray when she sees that Cameron's new date is Jen, and she hides from her behind a big vase like a child, bringing Tracy with her. She is extremely jealous of Jen. In Victoria's mind, Jen might be Cameron's potential wife. They eventually arrive at the location where everyone is standing, and Victoria returns there with Tracy. She bites at Jen's every remark and calls her witty. Cameron introduces Jen to his friends, and to everyone's surprise, Victoria knows who Jen is. As it turns out, Jen is a patent lawyer, and Cameron met her through work. Victoria jokes about this fact, but her joke just makes the situation even more uncomfortable than it was already. She feels the pressure in the room and immediately tries to bail out, but she is in so much euphoria that she first goes in the wrong direction. She is in an elevator with Tracy and Natalie. She says that everything is fine, but in reality, she is extremely angry and tries to contain herself. She says that they had been dating for 12 consecutive years when, out of nowhere, Cameron broke up with her because he never saw any future with her, and after just six months, she finds out that he found a new girlfriend. Victoria tries to reassure her friends that everything is fine, but her cracked voice says different things, and they don't believe her. They tell her that it's fine to be upset, and she admits that she is feeling rather disappointed because she thought that she would stay with him like a happy couple. But alas, it was not meant to be. Cameron was her first love, which makes her agonize over their breakup even more. Tracy reminds her that Cameron wasn't her first love, it was Jack, her long-distance boyfriend, whom she came across via a pen pal program that her high school was using at that time. They fell in love, and Jack even visited Victoria before college. She, on the other hand, was supposed to go to Paris the next year, but they broke up because Cameron appeared in her life, says Tracy, but Victoria denies it with a sad face, saying that it wasn't like that. Victoria's friends tease her, quickly steal her phone from her hands, search for Jack on social media, and call him. He doesn't respond, but they leave him a voicemail, and while all of this happens, Victoria is frozen for a second. She doesn't believe what her friends are doing and quickly tries to stop them. Jumping on her friend is a desperate attempt to steal the phone back, but the deed is done and nothing can be done about it. She angrily leaves that place. Jack works in his home when Alex arrives and brings him gifts. He urges Jack that he doesn't intend to pressure him with this gift to sell his property. This home holds great importance to him, so he needs time to think about this offer. Alex says that he doesn't have anything to worry about, and he is told that he has one week to think about this offer before he leaves. Jack picks up his phone and checks the voicemail. When he hears the voicemail Victoria's friend left him, his eyes spark up, and pleasant memories rush back to his mind. It is early in the morning. 
Hardworking Victoria is already on her job to choose the best champagne bottle for the wedding. She wants to bring Tracy with her, but because of her jet lag, she has to do it alone. She goes for the elevator when she hears Cameron's voice telling her to hold the door, but she doesn't want to be near him and tries to close the door as quickly as she can, but she fails. The awkwardness can be seen in the air as the two of them stand alone with nothing to say to each other. Soon, Cameron takes the initiative and asks her how she is, to which she hastily responds that she is fine. Cameron expresses his surprise about this Parisian wedding theme because he is not sure they will like it, even though he is sure Victoria will make it perfect. She gets angry at him because she thinks he doubts the one year that she spent planning this wedding. She teases him that Paris is always a good idea and looks at him like a puppy waiting for an answer. But she is disappointed because Cameron doesn't understand the reference she made from the movie they watched together because, in reality, he fell asleep during the movie. As he explains, old movies aren't his style. They try not to be uncomfortable, but it's for nothing because Victoria still searches for closure. While on the other hand, Cameron has already moved on. Victoria sits alone in a hall, completely absorbed in work and scrolling through her phone. Jack comes to Victoria, but she is so lost in her work that she thinks it's just one of the employees who brought her champagne to choose for the wedding. Jack plays along. He talks passionately about champagne, showing that he is the exact opposite of Victoria. Not as rational and pragmatic about life, he pays attention to his feelings and expresses them without a single thought, he is direct about everything. He says that champagne is what duct tape is to Americans, and as he is saying that Victoria remembers the past, they both say, because it fixes everything. She is in disbelief and jumps out of her chair and hugs him. She apologizes to him for this embarrassing display. They talk about the past. Victoria admits that she has been to France a couple of times, but she immediately adds that it was always for work to not make Jack uncomfortable. This was a golden opportunity for him to use, and he immediately seized it. He suggests that they go on a date for sightseeing and says that it is fine if she doesn't have time. Victoria jumps out of her chair with joy and tells him that she has some free time for herself. They don't waste another second and go on a date. They eat at a bakery and then stroll around the city. They catch up on what has changed throughout their lives, and both of them enjoy the time they are spending together. They smile and laugh, and the nostalgia brings back the memories they have forgotten. Jack traveled a lot until his father passed away three years ago. After that, he took over his business and is working as an antique restorer, and because of that, he has a lot of free time for himself. Victoria jokes that this has allowed him to stroll around the city aimlessly with an old pen pal, but Jack smoothly responds that it is not aimless, which intrigues Victoria. They look at the Eiffel Tower. Victoria says that this is extremely romantic. Jack answers her with a sad voice that maybe next time she should bring her fiancé here, to which she laughs and says that she must find that person first for that to happen. Jack tries to contain his happiness within himself after hearing this, but his eyes don't lie about it. He admits that he mistakenly thought that she was getting married. Victoria explains the whole situation to him. It's as if a huge weight was lifted from his shoulders. He immediately asks her if she is seeing someone. Victoria answers that she has been dating for 12 years until they broke up six months ago and the fact that Cameron is the best man at the wedding. As she is reminded of her past, she feels uncomfortable as if needles are going through her skin. Both of them laugh at Victoria's situation. The tables turn quickly, and now it was time for her to ask the question, and she asks him the same thing if he is seeing someone to which he boldly answers that he is seeing her. She is surprised by his statement, and they continue strolling. They return to the hotel together. Tracy recognizes Jack the moment she sees her. They chat around for a bit, and after a while, they invite Jack for a wedding activity. And then for dinner at 8 p.m. Jack doesn't want to be a burden, so he refuses at first, but after some persuasion, he agrees. Victoria, on the other hand, is really angry at Tracy once again, but she lets it slide because deep down something already has awakened, something lost, something forgotten. The dinner party starts. Everyone enjoys themselves. Victoria is dashing from one place to another to make sure that everything is going according to plan. She briefly stops to catch her breath when Jack arrives at the party. He immediately sees her, as does she. Their gazes are locked into each other's eyes, and time stops for them as if adolescent memories started to flood their minds. Jack compliments Victoria on how beautiful she is, and Victoria compliments him for being such a handsome prince. Soon enough, Cameron and Jen arrive at the party. Cameron immediately notices Victoria and Jack and rushes towards them. He greets them and introduces himself. They shake each other's hands, and Jack introduces himself. Cameron smiles, trying to show his superiority over him by mocking him and asking if he is the same pen pal Jack he has heard about years ago. Victoria aids him, saying that he is just an old friend Jack, and he adds that he is also plus one, which means he stays with Victoria for the entire week and he will have plenty of time to get to know her better. These words are like daggers hitting Cameron's heart for no reason because he should not be bothered by Victoria's new potential man, but the envy is killing him from the inside. 
They leave Cameron alone and go for a drink. Jack apologizes for his bold statement about staying with her for an entire week. Victoria says that it's fine because she needed that moral support, she just worries that he has a lot of work to attend to. He reassures her that everything will be fine because there is not a single Frenchman who won't have time for a party. As they are enjoying themselves and making plans for their new dates, Cameron's jealous gaze is focused only on them, not paying attention to his friends or even his girlfriend. Victoria, Natalie, and Tracy are together in a dress shop. Tracy tries on different dresses to choose the right one for the wedding. And she, after some convincing, agrees to buy the last one for the wedding. Later that day, they stroll around the city. Tracy nags at Victoria because even now she is completely lost in her phone. She explains that she just wants to congratulate her assistant on planning the first independent event successfully, she is being supportive of her subordinates. Natalie says that Mia, her assistant, is exactly like her when she started working as an event planner. They arrive at a restaurant where everyone else, besides Jack, waits for them. The party splits up. Cameron offers Victoria the chance to tag along with him and his girlfriend on their Paris tour, which she declines and says that she has a date with Jack. Once again, envy sparkled inside her ex-lover's heart. Victoria's date with Jack starts. He is a bit late, and he explains that it's in French men's blood to be a bit late on dates. Jack suggests that they start their date with a bakery. They go and order croissants. Victoria and Jack talk about their worldviews. She complains that she lost the carefree nature she had in her teenage days. As she grew up, she became more goal-oriented and obsessed with results, and because of that, she had to sacrifice her sweet worldview. Jack opposes her and says that she should take pleasure in everything in life, from every moment of joy she experienced to the trauma she had to endure to even a stroll in a city that has no purpose at all. Afterward, they enjoy the city together, going to various places. She mentions that the time she spent with him made her remember how she used to be in the past, even her dream about spending the summer in Paris. Victoria suddenly gets sad when she realizes that she has lost the skill to enjoy the little things that happen around her. Jack asks her what has changed. Victoria thinks for a while, and she answers that all of that happened because her business grew fast, for which she is thankful, but it made her sacrifice her sweet, young self and become more absorbed in her work. In the end, weddings are an industry. Jack smiles at her response, saying that he thinks it's more about getting two people who love each other to connect for their entire lives. Victoria agrees, but as said, it is for her to acknowledge that throughout the years she lost that joyful feeling she experienced every time she made a successful event for a couple. As they stroll around the city while talking and discussing various matters, they arrive at Jack's favorite place, the I Love You Wall. He explains that the artists who made this used 250 languages to write I love you 311 times. Victoria looks at this art piece and is amazed by it, but she doesn't get what the red splashes are used for. Jack thinks for a moment, trying to find the perfect words he must use to answer this question, and finally, he does. The red splashes represent the broken heart. Victoria is confused, she doesn't understand what a broken heart and love have in common. Jack smiles and answers, to love fully, you must embrace a broken heart. These words cut and amaze Victoria, and all she can say is how beautiful it is. Maybe at that moment, on that spot, new horizons arose for her because those were the exact words she needed to hear after the breakup. She feels refreshed as if the first step toward the healing process started for her at that moment. Victoria goes back to the hotel. Henry rushes toward Victoria with a devastated face. He is extremely sorry and apologizes to Victoria because she won't be able to hold the wedding here because the water damaged the roof of the hall and it is crumbling away slowly. Tracy arrives on the scene with her family to meet up with Victoria, where she is informed about this situation. They go to a cafe to discuss how they will deal with this problem. Tracy doesn't seem sure that everything will go as she wants, but Victoria calms her down by saying that everything will be fine as long as they stick to their plan. The party goes to a cooking lesson Victoria has planned. The chef says they will be cooking different dishes than the ones Victoria has planned for them. She immediately rushes to the chef's side to figure out what's going on. She is persuaded that what matters is for this process to be enjoyable. She looks at Tracy and Mike, realizing that she was wrong all this time. She goes to Jack, devastated, and explains how she never paid attention to what Mark and Tracy wanted. Instead, she got consumed by the idea of a grandiose wedding, completely losing the point of it, and now her best friend thinks that this wedding might be a mistake. Jack calms her down, saying that she still has time to fix everything. She agrees but is concerned about whether or not she will be able to do it in six days. Both of them agree that they should start to cook and think about this problem. Jack puts on the apron for Victoria. For a moment, their faces came up close together. Both of them feel extremely nervous about it. Victoria's heart almost explodes from the pressure she is experiencing at that moment. It's as if they want to kiss each other, but something mysterious is stopping them. Jack excuses himself to bring some eggs for a dish. Cameron seizes this opportunity and tries to talk to Victoria. The only thing he manages to say to her is whether she is fine or not. To which she answers that yes, she is fine. 
He tries to say something to her, but Jack arrives and makes him go away just by greeting him. Jack invites Victoria to his shadow to brainstorm wedding ideas. She loved the idea of having her entire being lightened up by the proposition, as she enjoys spending time with her pen pal. The cab stops, and Victoria comes out of the car, not believing what she sees. A glamorous, magnificent, enormous castle. As it turns out, Jack's grandparents bought it 70 years ago in a poor state. The castle was near collapse, but through hard work and dedication, it was restored to its former glory. The interior is as beautiful as the exterior. Victoria is stunned by all of this. She can't believe that he stays here all alone. Jack is engulfed by sadness as he tells Victoria that he might sell this home. He never thought of settling down in one place. He feels like a bird trapped in here. He would rather travel around the world, meet new people, and experience new challenges than this. He feels unimaginable loneliness living here. Victoria jokes that he can adopt a dog or repurpose it when suddenly her eyes widen as she suggests, that she can host the wedding here if Jack agrees. She returns to the hotel to notify her friends about this opportunity. They all go to check on Jack's place. Everyone seems to like it. Victoria, along with Mike and Tracy, discusses if this is the place Tracy dreamed about. For Tracy, this is even more than she could have imagined. Victoria starts to plan where the wedding will be held when suddenly she stops and realizes that she is doing the same thing she has been doing for years. Her heart fills with remorse and regret as she apologizes to her best friend for her past behavior. She was consumed by the fact that it was her best friend's wedding she was trying to make, and in the process, she forgot the most important thing to consider, her friend's needs. So she asked them where they thought they wanted the wedding to take place. Everything seems to be going in the right direction for the party. They plan together what they will be doing before the wedding starts, and then they split up for the rest of the day. Victoria decides to stay, and Jack is extremely delighted by her initiative. While Victoria works, Jack is making dinner for them. Victoria is amazed by his culinary skills. She doesn't understand how he can say that he is making a simple dish when he uses over 20 ingredients and three burners. Victoria is inexperienced in cooking. She prefers to order or buy fast food because it consumes significantly less time. For her, the most valuable resource is time. Jack asks her if she ever cooked together with Cameron and she says they never had great chemistry in the kitchen or in any other thing they were doing together. She thought both of them were very independent and focused on their careers. Victoria is confused because she isn't as motivated about her success as she was in the past. She knows that it is important to her, but something has changed and she isn't sure what. Jack suggests that maybe she feels alone, but she denies it, saying that she takes pride in being an independent, strong woman. But in the end, her resolve breaks, and she acknowledges that sometimes cooking for herself makes her sad. She is interested in what Jack thinks about this matter because he is the exact opposite of her. He says that he enjoys the cooking process so much that it doesn't matter if it is for him or someone else, but he prefers to cook for others because that's when he is happiest. They enjoy the dinner. She says that she would like some dessert, maybe a chocolate croissant, to which, to her surprise, he says that he has something even better. Victoria is excited and can't wait to see what he is going to show her. He returns with a box, where he saved all of the letters she wrote to him in the past. Victoria's heart melts, she doesn't believe that he held onto this letter all this time. She says that she poured all of her feelings into this letter, and that was the only time she was her true self. Jack admits that she broke his heart, she is stunned by his sincerity, but she says that he broke hers too. Victoria sadly talks about how maybe their love was just a puppy tale or something straight out of a fairy tale that was never meant to bloom, but she grew and decided that maybe it was time to move on and stop being a child in a fairy tale. Jack asks if all love is real, to which she answers that it's the problem because it gets too real. The mood darkened, Victoria understood that she hurt Jack with her words, and now she feels awkward about it. She laughs nervously and suggests that it was time for her to go back to the hotel. Jack takes her back. On the way to her room, Cameron stops Victoria. She is stunned and didn't expect this from Cameron. He admits that the breakup was a mistake because he realized in Paris, after seeing her with a different man, that he still has feelings for her. The entire world starts falling apart for Victoria. The next morning, she is with her friends, binge eating the cakes because of how complex the situation got. She confesses that her feelings for Cameron might still be alive because, for her, Cameron was the entire world. Victoria thought that it was the man with whom she would settle down. But alas, it was not meant to be. And now, finally, when she was getting over that fact with the help of Jack Cameron, he told her that he still has feelings. She feels confused and doesn't know what to do or what the next step should be. On the one hand, she has a man named Cameron, with 12 years worth of love and memories, and on the other, Jack, the man who makes her think that her childish dreams can become reality. Victoria, with her friends, is preparing flowers for the wedding. She notices some stranger talking to Jack. She goes to where they are. Jack introduces Alex to her. He reminds Jack that he should answer by the end of the week. Jack confesses to Victoria that he doesn't want to sell his property. He imagines that he would spend his 20s traveling around the world, and after that, he should settle here with his family, but sadly, he is all alone. Victoria advises him that maybe letting go of that thought would help him see things from a different angle, 
and finally move on, even though deep down she knows she hasn't moved on for quite some time and it's easier said than done. Jack asks her if she moved on from Cameron, to which she confesses what he did the previous day, and that she doesn't know it herself. That answer was like a backstab for Jack, but he tried to hold it in. The dusk neared. Once again, in their free time, Victoria and Jack go for a walk around the city. She tells him about her assistant's success, but at the same time, she feels sadness. Jack is perplexed, but she explains that she feels envious of Mia because she feels excited and happy about her first independent project, while this thrill has worn off for her. So Jack asks her an important question, whether she wants to do things differently or wants to do different things. A simple question to which she doesn't have an answer. She just wants to take a break from everything to have free time for herself, to venture into the unknown, but for her, that would mean setting herself up for failure. She can't let go of the past and the achievements she has accumulated throughout her work. It's just incomprehensible for her, but for Jacques, the answer to her problem is simplistic yet wise. The end goal shouldn't determine the rate of her success. The process that she will undergo is much more valuable to anyone than the result, and because of that, she doesn't have to worry about trivial things. She can let herself enjoy the little experiences and once and for all let herself rest. Cameron is waiting for the opportunity to spend some time with Victoria, and such an opportunity arises. Victoria is going to the caterer, and Cameron tags along. The caterer tells Victoria that the fancy food she ordered won't be possible to complete in time. But Victoria doesn't give up. She asks her to make something simpler, easier, and less time-consuming because, in the end, she taught her that what matters is for everyone to have a good time. The caterer gives up and promises Victoria that she will dedicate her heart to completing everything on time. Cameron and Victoria walk out of there. Cameron remembers their past and how he was reminded of the old sweet times, hoping that he would spark the old feelings in Victoria. He even admits to Victoria that he told Jen about his feelings toward Victoria, and he presses the idea that maybe they should get back together. Nervous, Victoria flees the scene, excusing herself that she has other matters to attend to when in reality it's her indecisiveness. She isn't sure if it's time for her to move on or return to her old life, one that offers new adventures and experiences and the other one is the same old sweet lifestyle, that she lived with Cameron for 12 years. The next problem that arose for the wedding was that the pastor who was going to hold the ceremony got suddenly ill. Mike and Tracy have already thought about it and offered this position to Victoria. She happily agrees to it. Once again, the entire party is on a city tour. Jack and Victoria sneak away from the party. They sit on a bench while enjoying the sweets. Jack sees the sweets crumble on Victoria's face. He gently takes it off her face and licks the finger in front of her. She isn't bothered by this at all. She even jokes that he just needed the excuse to do it. He laughs and says he doesn't need an excuse to touch her. They enjoy their flirting sessions, but when Victoria notices Cameron and Jen sitting in the opposite direction, they decide to leave that place. They arrive at the bridge, which is famous around the world for its emotional value. Couples from around the world would come here, write their names on the lock, lock it on the bridge, and throw the key into the river. But due to the additional mass, the bridge couldn't hold anymore and it collapsed, and now it's prohibited to do the same thing. Victoria thinks it's a sorrowful incident, but once again, to her surprise, Jack finds positivity in this accident as well. From his perspective, love isn't a concept that should be symbolized with locks, because in the end, for a heart to truly find one true love and feel the happiness it brings to a human being, his or her heart must be open rather than locked. These are the same words he once used to write to Victoria in his letters when he was explaining why he had given up on her in the past. If you truly love something, you must be able to set it free. But Victoria thinks otherwise. For her, it's not about letting go, it's about the amount of fighting you are willing to endure for your feelings. Jack asks her if she thinks it was a good idea to come to Paris. Victoria answers Paris is always a good idea, the same reference Cameron didn't understand. But to her surprise, Jack continued her quotation. As he is quoting the line, the whole world freezes for Victoria. The only person upon whom she can look now is Jack. She wants to go for a kiss, but something deep down holds her. She is doubtful that they will end up together because their worldviews are heaven and earth. Tracy is feeling rather down, her indecisiveness has taken hold of her, and she is not sure whether she is making the right choice or not. When she looks at her friend, she finds that marriage isn't a simple thing and is starting to have second thoughts about it. Victoria calms her down by saying that it's okay to feel overwhelmed by it. She has never seen a couple that didn't have any second thoughts about their marriage. She just shouldn't allow her fears to win. Alex once again visits Jack to know if he is willing to sell the property or not. He ponders for a while. The scene cuts to Victoria enjoying her free time alone in a garden. Happy Jack informs her that he decided not to sell the shadow. He thought all this time since he reconnected with Victoria that maybe he could repurpose the place with her, making it an event space or hall. She loves the idea and is excited about it. As they start to open up and consider their futures together, Cameron appears out of thin air. He says that the power has been cut off. Jack says that it's because of the black box and leads the way, despite being angry at Cameron for jumping into their conversation. He easily finds the problem. As he tries to fix it, Cameron starts belittling him, saying that he is a one-week affair for Victoria, 
and he doesn't stand a chance against him. With whom she spends 12 years of his life, he thinks she still loves him and is hesitant to admit it. Jack just listens to his pathetic remarks and smiles at Cameron, thinking what a little man he is in reality for saying things like this. After he fixes the power problem, Cameron rushes toward Victoria. He urges her that he wants to make up and doesn't wait for an answer. He forces himself onto her and kisses her. Coincidentally, Jack sees that. It devastates him. He once again feels betrayed by Victoria, and the old wounds open up once again for him. Victoria enjoys her evening coffee alone. She texts Jack but doesn't get a response. She wonders if something has happened that has made him change his heart. The party before the wedding starts. Stakes are at their peak. Everyone has something they worry about. Natalie is angry at Seth because since she got pregnant he has become overprotective of her and treats her like a child. She explains this to him, and finally, after trying to get through to him multiple times, she manages to calm him down. On the other hand, Tracy is feeling immense pressure, and Mike confronts her about this. She explains that she is having second thoughts. Mike gets extremely disappointed by Tracy's answer, but he doesn't get a chance to talk to her. That is because Tracy's mother is giving a speech about her daughter, who, throughout the course of her life, was only sure about one thing, and that was the decision to marry Mike. These words hurt Mike even more when he learned how she felt. On the third front, Cameron approaches Victoria. He apologizes for his barbaric behavior and wants to know the answer to his question. Victoria's face is at peace because she has already decided what her answer will be. She says that it was hard for her to move on because he was a big part of her life and that was what kept her tied down all this time. But now that she has accepted the fact, it's time to move on and let go of the past. Finally, the storm arrived. Jack comes to Victoria. He starts talking, explaining that he is glad that they reconnected and that he takes full responsibility for what happened here. He knows that she wasn't over Cameron but tried to make his feelings bloom into something beautiful and majestic, but in the end, he thinks Victoria used him to make Cameron jealous. Victoria gets angry, she doesn't know that he saw the kiss, and she asks him if that's how he thinks. She is interested in why he is breaking up with her, maybe because their worldviews are so different. Victoria is confused and lost, she is on the verge of tears. Jack tries to say something, but all he can say is that he will meet her at the wedding, and he leaves. Tracy is extremely nervous because she hurt Mike. Her mother tells her that she should go to Mike and say how she truly feels about him because, deep down, she knows Mike is truly the love of her daughter's life. She listens to her mother's advice and immediately rushes to Mike. She confesses her unwavering and undying love for him and says that it's the only thing she has ever been sure of in her life. Before the wedding starts and while Tracy is preparing her dress, Victoria makes a phone call to her mother. It turns out she has also kept the letters from Jack. She asks her mother to take a picture of a particular letter and send it to her. The wedding starts. Everything seems perfect, and even if it's even possible, it's more than perfect. Everyone stands at their place. Victoria's time to marry Mike and Tracy has come. She prepared a speech beforehand. She opens her speech with a simple yet difficult question, to which even great philosophers fail to find an answer. People are often told that it is the interlocking of two souls, but no, love isn't a lock. It's rather an act of embracement, to embrace the flaws, dreams, hopes, fears, and hurts, an act to embrace what is and what can be, what life could be or what we could be, she says. Many ask what the key to love is, but tend to forget that love doesn't need a key or a lock because it isn't locked. And when she looks at Mike and Tracy, she feels that true love indeed exists. Jack is listening to her beautiful speech and is surprised and pleased to discover that these are the same words he once wrote to her. Victoria finally weds them. Everyone enjoys the wedding, some are dancing, some eat, and some joke about random things. At last, Jack and Victoria meet up. Jack compliments her on her beautiful speech and apologizes. He admits that he was wrong. Jack learned that if you love someone, you can set her free, but at the same time, you can hold on to it and fight for it. He is ready to fight for Victoria because she is the woman who changed his life. Jack isn't the only one who was changed in this short time. Victoria admits that she is also unsure where their feelings will lead them, but she is sure of one thing, she wants to wander with him. They look into each other's eyes and start dancing slowly yet passionately, and finally, they kiss, connecting the two human beings who had opposite worldviews once again and proving that love beats any obstacles.